Another question I get is, um, well, that flagellum is interesting and intracellular transport is interesting that you talked about in Darwin's black box, but that was 20 years ago. So what have you done for me lately? I mean, what are the new and exciting irreducibly complex systems in, uh, in, in life, in biochemistry? Well, they keep, you know, rolling along. You know, every time you turn around, every week, every month or so, new and exciting and interesting systems uh, seem to be published in the major science journals. A couple that, uh, that I think are particularly intriguing, there's one called bacteriophage T4. Bacteriophage is a virus, and viruses uh, will infect cells, of course, and bacteriophages are viruses that in infect bacteria. So they uh, land on a cell and they go into the cell and they eat the insides of the cell in order to make or get energy and, and materials to make copies of themselves. Well, I don't know if you've ever seen a drawing of a bacteriophage, but it kind of looks like a lunar lander, uh, some of them. It's got a top on it and then a, a thin connection and then these legs that attach to the cell. And what the bacteriophage does is it sticks the narrow part in through the cell membrane and injects the DNA from the cell into the poor bacteriophage or bacterium that it's going to eat. Well, uh, a couple of years ago, using a new technique called cryo electron microscopy, people looked in detail at this mechanism. And it's really, it's like, a, it's like an automated syringe that as soon as the legs touch the surface of the cell, it triggers a change in the shape of the uh, lunar lander so that it shrinks and goes, and the uh, narrow part goes down in with, with a fair amount of force and injects the DNA. And it's not only cool in its own right, but you say to yourself, there are hundreds and hundreds of proteins involved in this. And they're all there to do one thing, to inject the DNA into the cell. So that's a swell example of irreducibility that wasn't known uh, except for uh, until a couple of years ago. Another kind of improvement or <laughs> building upon uh, an example that I talked about in Darwin's Black Box 20 years ago is a, another bacterium and its flagellum. There's a bacterium called MO1, which was isolated off uh, the seas of Japan. And it has a flagellum that spins about 10 times as fast as a normal flagellum and allows this bacterium to really whip through the water. And there's a prominent Japanese group that looks at flagella and they uh, looked at it by electron microscopy and some other techniques. And they saw that in fact, in this tail that the bacterium has, there were seven separate flagella all packed together and they all rotated uh, at the same time in order to push it forward. But if you think about it, you say, well, if this is rotating this way, and so is this, they'll, they'll knock against each other, they'll brush against each other, and, um, and the whole thing will come to a kind of a crashing halt. But the Japanese group showed that they don't actually touch each other, that there are other proteins that work as uh, interdigitating gears. That is, there's a, like a gear between them so that as this rotates, the uh, gear rotates in the same direction and so does the other uh, flagellum so that they're all rotating in sync in the same direction, but with this separating gear, then it can uh, uh, I'm sorry, it's a counter-rotating gear, 
uh, with that, uh, it can, uh, they can all spin together without bumping against each other. This shows a separate level of design. We had the flagellum that I talked about you know, earlier. And here's something that is a really uh, an improvement on it, a, an expansion of it. The, uh, you couldn't pack flagella together and have them work. You needed from the beginning something to keep them uh, separated from each other. So this system is another irreducibly complex one, and it's an example of design building upon design, the higher and higher and higher levels. And just one more example, or kind of a class of examples, um, is that the big news these days is that more and more control systems are being discovered in the cell so that they're uh, so that the control of things that the cell does is, is really exquisite. Um, there are things called genetic regulatory networks that decide when to turn a gene on or a, a suite or a cascade of genes. And that's necessary because some genes are only expressed for a brief time during the life of an organism, and then they're turned off until because their job is done. For example, organisms that are growing up, but then they start to enter, you know, puberty or, or uh, some other phase of life. And there are genes that have to be turned on and then turned off when their job is done. And that's especially true in the developing embryo. As an embryo goes from one stage to another, there are specialized genes that are, are needed. And if you look at the systems that control exactly when those go on and off. Uh, if you look at the, uh, you can write them down as kind of this gene affects that gene and this slows down the other one. And it looks like a very complex wiring diagram. And uh, genetic uh, regulatory biologists, folks who study this for a living have said, well, yes. and they said pretty much in so many words that this too is irreducibly complex because if you don't have the whole system, it's not going to turn on at the right time. And if you get some of these steps wrong, you'll have a, you know, a birth defect, a, a, you know, a mutation or a, uh, an organism that uh, is so badly formed it, it, doesn't get, uh, it doesn't get born. <clears throat> 